Getting back to this scene, again, Monk correctly points out that Centara justifies her product the same way drug dealers justify theirs. That it's justified because there's a market for it. And as an amoral capitalist, Centara responds logically. She feels drugs should be legal. Is this because Centara values freedom of choice? Or is it because Centara, like the free market, demands customers? There is a necessarily detached, cold ideology among a psychotic version of the businessman, and there is a considerable range to the degree of psychopathy involved, and it depends on the product or service being sold. And while negligent selfishness as commerce is pervasive, this movie shows us a specific area where it manifests in black culture as well. If it had a mantra or anthem, it would be, I gotta get mine. Which of course means making money by any means at anyone else's expense. In the business world, this is known as an externality, a term you should be familiar with if you're not already. An externality is essentially the downstream cost or expense of a business operation paid for or suffered by others. Here's a literal and figurative example of downstream consequences. If a paint factory dumps benzene used in the production or refining of its products into a nearby stream, the cancer suffered by the residents who drink the now tainted groundwater would be considered externalities. And who cares? I gotta get mine. And if a rapper writes a song over a really dope beat about murdering another black man over some beef or slight, the psychological impact of that song or product and the pathology, violence, and destruction that stem from it could also be rightfully and coldly classified as externalities. But who cares? I gotta get mine. To be fair, it might be wise to concede the difference between the paint factory poison and the gangster rap song. The hip hop song provides informed consent, while the paint factory does not. Some might argue that technically externalities is not a term that extends to informed, willing customers, but I'd maintain that's a negligible distinction since both are examples of harm visited on others in pursuit of profit. And profit is essentially Centara's shorthand response in defense of her bestseller, a product that Monk views as corrosive. Centara doesn't care. She's interested in sales. And while she is refreshingly frank about her financial motivation, she still manages to put a small positive spin on her actions by invoking the importance of representation or telling the stories of low-income black people. This gives Centara's selfish goals a veneer of altruism. Whether she's sincere about doing any good as she pursues sales is something we can only speculate on. We don't really know what's in her heart. But Centara, as a smart, calculating person, is a type of character that has weighed the pros and cons of her choices and has rationalized that any harm done in the continual promotion of the black struggle is outweighed by the arguable, positive awareness it creates, and more importantly, if we're cynical enough, by the lifestyle the success of telling those stories affords her. If everyone else is a calculating business person, why can't she be too? Why must black people feel constrained by the highest standards of morality when the entire business world is awash in immorality and amorality? That's a fair question to ask, and a great one for the audience to consider. But you, you're, not, you're not fed up with it. The black people in poverty, uh, Black people rapping, black people as slaves, black people murdered by the police, whole soaring narratives about okay. black folks in dire circumstances who still manage to maintain their dignity before they die. Monk is able to rattle off these tropes so effortlessly, and we can recognize them because they exist, not just on TV and in movies, but in real life. But he follows up this observation and concession with a real gem that articulates what he'd prefer to see. I mean, I'm not saying these things aren't real, but we're also more than this. And it's like so many writers like you can't envision us without some white boot on our necks. Do you get angry uh, at Brett Easton Ellis or Charles Bukowski for writing about the downtrodden? Or is your ire strictly reserved for black women? So here, Centaura rightly questions Monk's motives and the legitimacy of even questioning her chosen path to success. Again, 
Why can't Centara be allowed to get hers when everyone else is getting theirs? People are compelled to operate in the world they live in, not the one they'd like to live in. This is a sound, respectable perspective offered by Centara, and her thought process illustrates her keen rationale about achieving success in publishing, given the realities of the consumer's tastes. After all, she's only selling what people are buying. And what could be wrong with that? What could be more American? Monk counters with an equally cogent response, which is succinct and excellent. Yeah, you, nobody reads Bukowski thinking his is the definitive white experience, but people, white people read your book and confine us to it. They think that we're all like that. And I love this response and how it supports what was shown a few moments ago, specifically when John, as a critic, confirmed that he liked f in the precise manner that Monk describes here. This insight suggests John's view of black people, or more generously, a type of black person. The book validates John's beliefs and expectations. And Monk sees how media portrayals of black people can cement preconceived notions. And he views that as the primary problem because he's emotionally invested in the elevation of black people and the black experience. Monk wants to identify and be associated with a higher version of blackness. As someone who grew up in an upper middle class home, he knows that black people of all economic levels are not just how they're portrayed on screens. In making his points, Monk, serving as a surrogate for the director's view on black representation, goes beyond answering what's wrong with all of this and explains why it's wrong. And because Monk is so earnest and believable, his statements weave seamlessly into the story because it is the story. So it avoids the trap of making the film seem like it's preaching. You need an authentic character and a plot sequenced and executed properly to achieve this. Beyond this, and despite his surliness, Monk remains a sympathetic character, one whose sympathies are so well articulated that anyone can understand them, even beyond racial categories, because the desire to be on a winning team is a universal one. And so anyone with enough empathy might be able to see a bit of themselves in Monk, a tremendously well thought out well-written character.